larger than life, prodigiously gifted, a true all-rounder. He was the subject of tabloid media hype and hysteria, a rebel who didn't always have a cause. England's hero, a true match winner. Ian Botham is one of ESPN's legends of cricket. Ashes series has become a part of English cricket folklore. The series will forever be remembered as Botham's Ashes. 81 Headingley, Birmingham, Manchester, three magnificent games, uh, three magnificent solo performances. They are going to stand out. And because it was an Ashes series, well, okay, that means it's uh, indelibly etched in our minds forever. And this bowled in, but surely it's going to be it. I think the crowd got. Uh majority of those wickets for me because the atmosphere it was uh, you could actually see it in, it intimidated the batsmen coming out I don't care what they say you could see it you know the, you see it in their eyes and you ran in and the crowd and this, this noise it just it built up I, I would imagine it would be like uh, a, a Roman amphitheatre you know the gladiators it was uh, very very intimidating for the people out there if you're on the receiving end and that's it this time he's made sure he's taken five wickets he grabs a stump and another memorable victory for England. Botham was a big muscular man, nicknamed variously as Beefy, Boff, or Guy the Gorilla. But he was no wild slogger. His batting technique was good. His defense was excellent when he chose to use it. And he hit the ball as hard as anybody in the game. All good shot, straight down the ground. Botham doesn't bother running. When he hits them, they stay hit. Botham had awesome power. Ian Botham, um, I, I, I think Botham is, if, if I had to name the players of the last 25 years, I, I'd say Ian Botham is as good a player all round that we've ever seen. Charging, hitting it away over extra cover, into the stand, six runs for Ian Botham. The great thing was, was simply that he believed he could win a game almost single-handedly. Uh, at virtually any time. Any team meeting you care to mention you know, throughout those 15 years or so of his test career and he would say this is a waste of time let's just go and beat them tomorrow. What are we talking about this for? And he'd be sort of thumping the table, uh, be all enthusiasm and I suppose of all the players I've played with over the years he's the one who could actually back it up with his deeds on the field. Yeah. Oh, it's bold. As a bowler both of them could swing the ball both ways from a fairly short run and he had a remarkable knack of getting good batsmen out with bad balls. Oh, he's got him. He's nicked that. He's caught behind. Both of them struck straight away. He could swing it both ways and he bowled a fairly useful change of pace bouncer. He had a slower ball. Um, you know, uh, all I can say is, you know, you don't get 300 and something wickets by bowling rubbish. And, and not only that, but he kept on knocking over top players. As a bowler, um, you know, he took over the 300 wickets, probably a little bit on the expensive side at times. Um, he always didn't mind buying wickets, not like a lot of English bowlers who bowled line and length. But both of them used to come in and try things. He'd bounce guys and he'd get hit for four. Didn't mind that. So as long as he set up someone, he had always had a plan. Didn't mind giving away runs and trying to get wickets. In the field, both of them were sure-handed. He could field anywhere. He was a magnificent slips fielder. He was a good outfielder too. I mean, there were plenty of times we sent him out to patrol the boundaries. He had a good arm. Um, he could catch the ball whether he was 10 yards from the bat or 110 yards from the bat. Coming in, they're going to take him on. Oh dear! He's out. Well, he he's always been one of my favourite cricketers. Uh, larger than life, both on and off the field. And uh, there was always something happening when when Botham was around, when he batted or bowled. And like him or hate him, you can't keep this man out of the limelight. I'm going to talk about a real all-rounder. OK, someone who can do all that on the field and do everything that he did off the field as well. The way that man has lived life, you know, he is the genuine all-rounder. There's the century. Four runs just in front of points. Ian Botham, 103. 
his 13th Test century. Playing for Somerset, Ian Botham announced his presence on the cricket stage on the 12th of June, 1974. He was 18 years old, facing a fearsome bowling attack, and his side was under pressure. It was uh, Hampshire against Somerset, I think it was a quarter-final. Andy Roberts bowled me a bouncer. Well, <coughs> you know, I was a little boy from Yeovil Town, I hadn't seen anything like this. And Andy came steaming in, bounced me, and I thought for a moment of stupidity, actually I think for a split second, or a thousand of a second, thought about hooking it. But then instinct and common sense took over, and I, I ended up defending myself. And uh, the ball hit me here, went on and grazed my, oh, cut up here, nothing serious. And uh, two teeth out here and two on the recall this side. It was quite a, fall, quite a bang. Um, actually, it probably did me a lot of good because I think I was probably concussed and I went on and got the runs. Despite the blood and smashed teeth, Botham stayed at the crease to make 45 not out, win the game and start the legend. Well, my first recollections of Botham were before he was even picked for England. He was out in Melbourne during the centenary test match on a, uh, an SO scholarship. They quickly stopped their sponsorship of uh, cricket after Ian's involvement with them in uh, Melbourne. And um, he was meant to be helping out in the dressing room. Benson and Hedges, the sponsors of the centenary test match, had uh, 500 bats, no less, that we had to sign during the game. And his job with Graham Stevenson, the former Yorkshire bowler was to get us a lot to sign these bats but you'd come into the dressing room in the morning and Ian would be curled up in the corner asleep having been out all night to, on the Terps. So we knew what we were letting ourselves in for when he finally made the England side in uh, 1977. Botham played his first test match in 1977 and made an impact from day one. I said then that this lad would go on and put his name in the record books, yes. But I'd also said that before he played his first test, because I'd seen him play a few games, quite a few I'd umpired when he played for Somerset. And I said then that this kid was going to go all the way. And his bowling, first ball, his first wicket in test match cricket, and what a scalp to get. He came with a pretty big reputation, and, um, and to take five wickets was just um, outrageous. Against our, against our side, who boasted, you know, a couple of couple of chapels in there, you know, it, it sorts them out. And you've got Doug Walters as well. He was, um, he showed glimpses of what was to come. Field. That's it. That's the hundred. Back with a square leg. That's the hundred to Botham. Botham made his first Test century in early 1978 against New Zealand. Got off to a flying start. Uh, five wickets in your first match, and then another five wicket haul and then uh, New Zealand 100 came and then it just all seemed to happen so quickly and it was great. In 1979, Botham achieved the double of 1,000 runs and 100 wickets in tests, faster than anyone in history. Beefy, I mean, I think even he will admit and everyone feels about his career that, that in the early days it was the bowling rather than the batting that, that, that you noticed. I mean, he never bowled as well as he did maybe in the first three years of his, his career. I mean, he, there was that innings against the Australians, yes, as an unknown, he came in, he took five wickets. He totally demolished Pakistan the following year at Lords. With, I'd never seen a ball, I don't think, swing as much as it did that innings. He bowled virtually unchanged in Bombay in really quite searing heat in 80, in the Jubilee Test. I mean, that, that was Beefy's early careers as a swing bowler and, and he was awesome. Yeah, he's one of those guys that he just believes he, he can score the, the runs necessary or take the wicket or take the catch. He's just, he's so confident um, in, in his abilities that uh, you know, he backs himself the hill. A huge influence in this early stage of Botham's career was the English captain Mike Brearley. Well, Briers, I, I suppose you'd say, was a little bit like a fatherly figure uh, for me. We, we got on well, first of all, which I think is important. Uh, I think it was the uh, Aussie boys who'd said that the thing with Mike Brearley is he's got a degree in people. And that really is a very good way of summing him up, because um, when you speak to him and meet him for the first couple of times, you can always feel his eyes looking straight, all straight past here, he's in here somewhere, seeing what's going on in there. He, 
He's a remarkable guy, but I enjoy playing with him. Um, he gave me uh, a bit of freedom to express myself, and uh, we used to have some quite good rapport in the slips. Botham began 1980 with a remarkable performance in the one-off Jubilee Test in India. He scored 114 and took 13 wickets. Shortly after, he took over the captaincy of England from his mentor, Brealey. I think in a way that self-belief, that sort of belief that he could win under any circumstances, hampered his captaincy. Because it's not easy to transmit that to 10 other players, uh, some of whom, inevitably, being more mortal, as it were, than Ian, would have uh, the odd little bit of doubt there. And I think as a captain, he would look back now and say, well, actually, he needed to do more than he did. There was the same sort of feeling pre, pre a game, let's just go and do it, lads. Um, and you need more than that. I think you need to do more than that as a captain. You need to understand the needs of individual players more. And it was, it was just proof, I think, that at that stage of his career, in fact, the captaincy wasn't quite what he needed. Ian, his approach to captaincy probably might be his approach to the, the way he played his cricket. And, and a bit more intense. You need somebody there who's going to be more intense and want to, to, to go a little deeper. The low point of his captaincy came during the 1981 Ashes series. After poor English performances in the first two tests, Botham resigned. I, I can remember really well when he left Lords in that second innings, having made naught, and he was a captain of a team that was playing rubbish. Beefy walked back and his bat the wrong way up and he, he, there was total silence in the pavilion. In the air and six. Botham then produced those memorable performances that would destroy Australia and re-establish himself as England's favourite son. From that point, you know, we get a totally different cricketer. We turn up at Headingley for the next test match Ian's batting performance in that particular test match you know, will always stick in my mind as being you know, Ian Botham at his absolute belligerent best. Um, we're at tea time day four. England have got no chance. Um, but the, the period between tea time and stumps was some of the most extraordinary cricket you'd ever want to see. Before you knew it, you know, almost in that period of two hours, the whole game had just turned around and you know, that's what he could do to, to a cricket match. And he did it quite a number of times, particularly against us. Botham followed his match winning 149 in the third test with a devastating five for one bowling spell in the fourth match at Edgbaston, once again snatching an unlikely victory for England. Well, the thing is, is that Australia were 89 for three. And I think they only needed 130 odd or something like that to win the test. 89 for three, so I thought to myself, well, it's only a matter of time before they get these runs, and I know Brealey said to Both, have you, can you give me what have you got left? And Both said, I'll give you everything I've got, he said to, to Brealey, because he respected Brealey so much. And he came on at the city end at Edgebaston, and uh, the rest is history. He took five wickets for one run and won the test for, for, for England. It was an amazing performance. Having completely transformed the series, Botham then delivered the knockout blow to the Australians with another century in the fifth test. I really enjoyed that, to take on Dennis Lilly, who I think is the best bowler of all time, to take him on and uh, to win that day and win comprehensively was a nice feeling. In the air, and again. I think he really felt he got the better of Lilly at, at Old Trafford because he waited till the new ball came and if you remember, he, he scratched around for a bit with the old ball and it was just when the new ball came on, then he went into top gear and he kept hooking him off, off his eyebrows, didn't he? It, it, was, it was absolute magic. After 1981, he was plagued by back problems, which affected his mobility. Although he would struggle to stay fit, he continued to produce magic moments. In the 1985 Ashes series at home, Botham took 31 wickets, once again reserving his best for his favourite foe, Australia. I think as much as anything, it's the way the Aussies play the game. Um, I've always admired that, they play really hard on the field. Uh, don't expect anything, don't give anything. <clears throat> but in the days when I came into the game, you, know, you come off the field and 
If we'd been uh, fielding all day, you put your feet up, the Aussies who'd been batting would come in with a couple of cold beers, you'd sit down and chew the cud. I mean, there was, it was war out there, believe me, on the field. But, you know, it's six o'clock, so time to relax. And I learnt a lot from listening to those guys and um, what they had to say. Ian, both of them, was a wonderful character, great bowler, you know, 383 test wickets, 14 test hundreds, all that type of stuff. I never got the both of ashes in 1981, thankfully. I was there, I watched it, but uh, a wonderful fella. In 1986, Botham became the highest wicket taker in test matches. And taken by Jack Richards. In Australia in 1986-87, he took five for 41 in Melbourne and made 138 in Brisbane. Straight down the ground, beautifully played, and that brings up in Botham century. That's probably one of the best innings I've seen him play. We're in a situation where we had England in a little bit of trouble, and all of a sudden Ian turned up the crease, and typical of him, he, he, he sums it up the situation pretty quickly. He decides, right, I'll take the attack to the Aussies, they've got their nose in front, we'll see what happens. And, and talk about sort of, you know, from one minute you've, you've got a real sniff, you know, good decision to send them in, we've got England in a bit of strife. Uh, an hour and a half later, you're sort of, you know, deflated. You know, he's just taken the wind right out of your sails with this, uh, you know, extraordinary batting. And that's the way he played. Both of them are getting a standing ovation from the crowd here at the Gabba for a magnificent contribution. Throughout the late 80s, Ian Botham was becoming better known for what he did off the field than what he did on it. I guess in that environment in England, he had uh, nowhere to, to escape from the public eye. Um, he, so he just accepted it and got on with it. Um, and from time to time, obviously, it came unstuck with the, the way the media p portrayed him. But uh, to his credit, he just kept his head up and kept going. Yeah, I mean, he was a superstar, um, no doubt about it. He still is. I mean, people still seek his opinions, still want him for breakfast, lunch and dinner to talk about his exploits. And it was strange at times that he became a bit of a recluse because he's naturally gregarious, he likes a party, he likes going out, still does. And it, it is extraordinary, it's an extraordinary contrast that there is a man who is larger than life, there is a man who adores the stage as a player, and yet just at the end of it there, it was all too much, or could have been all too much, off the field, and he had to do that to himself. In general, I, I actually got on very, very well with the, uh, the majority of the cricket writers, you know, inverted commas, the real, the real reporters from our point of view. Uh, what was a problem was that um, there was a tabloid war going on, which everyone's aware of, and there's, you know, what, 65 million people on this rock, and uh, it's big business. So, obviously, uh, um, there was a period where some editors perhaps didn't worry quite so much about uh, whether it was true or not. Ian Botham retired from Test Cricket in 1992. Fittingly, his final first-class match for Durham in 1993 was against the touring Australians. One morning, it took me about seven or eight minutes, literally, to get out of bed. And I thought, oh, I've had enough of this. You know, it's very frustrating when you can't perform as you had before. So it just made sense to me, well, get out and, you know, I'm not enjoying it. I, and I knew that there was no future for me in the England side. Uh, but, yeah, so what's the point of me uh, cluttering up first-class cricket and get out of the way and let some youngsters come through? He's off again, great shot. Ian Botham bounded into the spotlight in 1977, the year in which most of the world's best players defected to Kerry Packer's World Series cricket. He was seen as a gifted, carefree young gun who played for love rather than money. He brought flair and passion to the Dewar English game, on and off the field. He changed English cricket, really. I really think he had a, a bit of West Indian blood in him, really, the way he plays. But uh, when, he was, when he had a ball in his hand, you know, he was doing something all the time. When he, he went out to bat, he played, he played like he wanted to play, not what the coach might tell or the captain might, might, might tell him. But um, he enjoyed his cricket, and he, he, great, he gave England great service, and gave, and gave cricket in general, you know, a bit of a boost. Well, Ian Botham you know, is, the, is the last action hero, as far as I'm concerned, uh, particularly for English cricket. Um, you know, he, he hasn't played now for what the best part of seven or eight years and you know his exploits are still talked about you know in rev revered sort of terms uh, particularly when you're talking about Ashes battles and um, 
I think what made him so good is that he's, he's, he's one of these larger than life sort of characters. He's one of those blokes that um, he never believes there's any situation that he can't, you know, do something about. Ian Botham played in 102 test matches. He made 5,200 runs at an average of 33.54 with 14 centuries. He took 383 wickets at an average of 28.4 and completed 120 catches. He was one of cricket's great all-rounders. For a few wonder years, Botham was the miracle man. He seemed superhuman. When he turned out to be very human indeed, those very flaws seemed to make him even more popular. He was a working class hero in the pastime of aristocrats. What a bloke to have around you. I played with him at Durham. I was the first overseas professional ever for Durham and he was the major signing. Taught me how to drink red wine. <laughs> but what a bloke, he's walked everywhere. Not many people know the fact that he's actually made eight million pounds for leukemia doing his walks, um, charity, etc. I know he's had a couple of bad spots here and there with, with the media and doing a few funny things, but above all, the best thing I could say about Ian Botham, that he's good enough to be Australian. He's got a huge uh, zest for life. Whatever he does, he does it at 100 miles an hour. Um, he hardly ever stops, whether it's uh, in his commentating role or uh, playing golf or eating and drinking, which he's pretty good at. One of the great characters uh, of world cricket on the field and off the field. He likes going out. He likes, he's a social animal. He's a party animal. Um, in fact, there's, there's none of us can keep up with him if he's in the mood. I mean, the, the story is, you know, basically, for years now, we try to share it around. If someone goes out with him on a Monday night, well, it's someone else's turn on a Tuesday night. And uh, woe betide anyone who goes out with him at a weekend. But throughout his career, fine, he worked hard, played hard. Yeah, great, great friend and great company. But um, if, you, if you sit there and try and go drink to drink with him, um, I know who's going to come off second best. <laughs> Beefy just lives every day for, for the day. When Beefy goes out for dinner, you would think it's the last time he's going to have dinner. He goes out, he enjoys himself, has a few bottles of wine, has a nice lovely meal, and he just goes out and tries to get the best of every day. He's not thinking, okay, let me hold back a bit, tomorrow is another day. He just tries to enjoy every day, and that is the way I think you have got to live. It's a great way to live. Botham was a shooting star the quickest to take 100 wickets and score 1,000 runs in test matches. At his peak, he routinely achieved the unlikely and occasionally the impossible. He is without doubt one of ESPN's legends of cricket.